Hello, I'm David Green, one of the owners here at CJM Wealth Advisors, and we'll be speaking to you here today uh, about the basics of estate planning. We're going to try to cover this in two parts. Uh, this first part's going to focus more on the basics and the need for estate planning, and we might cover a little more advanced techniques in the second webinar. And with that, we'll turn it over to our two guests here today, Dan Vaughn and Martha Satella. Thank you for being with us. Uh, principals at Vaughn Fincher Satella, a local estate planning firm whom we've worked with for decades at this point. So, um, again, appreciate you joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. We're excited to have you uh, give us some guidance and insight uh, on a topic, again, that impacts everybody, um, and that is estate planning. And so why don't we start with um, a pretty easy question, a pretty broad question of what is estate planning? Well, estate planning is a combination of two things. It's defense in the sense that we look forward and, and down the road in the planning world and, and identify potential risks, things that could happen down the road in life that could cause problems, could cause complication cost-wise, uh, logistical complication, and we put planning in place to minimize or eliminate, where possible, those potential risks. So it's risk management defensively. Sure. It's also offense in the sense that we create a vision for how we want to leave our resources down the road, uh, the beneficiaries that we'd like to provide for, and the way that we'd like to provide for them. And we create an infrastructure, a system, that can allow those resources to reach those beneficiaries in the most productive way. Makes sense. Martha, anything to add? Well, I think when I talk to clients about estate planning, one of the things that we want to look at are what are the goals? What are the goals of the family in terms of you know, how they want to reach the, the distribution scheme and how do we get there? Uh, I often talk about that we're looking at you know, different alternatives and we'll walk them through that. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect plan. I think that that's important to understand. Uh, but we will get you to a place where you're going to be in a better position than if you had no plan. And when you hear the term estate planning, sometimes in your mind you think that you have to have an actual estate mm -hmm. down in Charleston, South Carolina, and it only impacts um, those with very complex estate or the super wealthy. Um, not true, correct? Right. Absolutely not true. Everybody who has property, if you have real property, if you have cash, anything that, if you have those assets, you need to think about where they're going to go at your death and how you want to get them. And how do we get them to that destination? The extent of your wealth can impact how you plan, but it doesn't determine whether you should plan. Because a lot of the issues that we deal with are not connected to the amount of assets somebody has. And so, Everyone needs to do some level of planning, and yes, that could be impacted by how much real estate, how many financial assets you have, but whether you should plan or not is a universal concept. Yeah, I think that's a good simplified way to, to put it. I, and, and in summary, sometimes we'll share with our clients that estate planning is, is whatever you want to have happen, mm -hmm. make sure it happens. Right. Um, so let's take that and transition into um, the basic estate planning documents that most clients may need. Martha, why don't you start? What, what should we be thinking about first if I'm a client um, coming to you? And, and let's start with a hypothetical couple of Mr. and Mrs. Davis and they have some adult children and they come to you and have never even really considered estate planning. Where do you start? So I usually start looking at decision making for them. So if they became incapacitated, what documents would they need to make sure that they can be taken care of? I mean, selfishly, when you're going through a process like this, you have to consider what you need to take care of you. So where I usually start is with the advanced medical directive. Now that's what we call it in Virginia. Some other states may refer to it as a medical power of attorney and a living will. That's a term that, that's still used. Uh, in Virginia, our legislature decided to take the medical power of attorney and the living will or end of life instructions and put that all into one document. And now we call it the advanced medical directive. 
Uh, it's important to have, uh, especially if there's a situation, for instance, like you're unmarried and you have a significant other that you would want to make decisions for you. Uh, if you don't have that medical directive, then they are going to be precluded from making those decisions for you because there, there is a statute, there's a Virginia statute, which sets forth, you know, who could make a decision if you don't have that document. But that statute is, you know, going through basically presumptions, your spouse, your children, and those things. Yeah. So let me take apart the watch a little bit and mm -hmm. make sure that our listeners understand incapacitation, mm -hmm. first of all, an example or a couple examples of... When, when does that apply? So I'm, I'm living still, right. right? You're still living, exactly. And, and so for the advanced medical di directive, again, under Virginia law, you can make a medical decision for yourself as long as you are able to do so. Sure. But if it, there comes a time when a doctor and a second doctor or someone which is called a capacity reviewer, so it could be someone who's a psychologist who's trained in you know, assessing capacity, if those two come together and say, you know what, Dave, you are not able to make a decision for yourself any longer for medical reasons, now your agent under this document can come in and make a medical decision for you. And it's a pretty broad range of decisions. You know, again, any decision that you could make for yourself, that agent now has the power to do that. So going back to our sample clients, Mr. Davis just had a stroke and he's in the hospital. This is a document that's going to help Mrs. Davis and or their children do what? Well, first of all, Mrs. Davis, while likely the default in the state statutes is access to medical information and the ability to be in the room and talk to the doctors, there have been times where the decision to be made is profound enough, it's big enough, and maybe there are other voices in the room that aren't totally in concert with what Mrs. Davis is saying, and now the doctors start to get nervous because there's no specifically authorized person to make a decision. And this document will allow her to approach the medical community, number one, to get medical information, uh, whether that's where Mr. Davis is or maybe it's Mr. Davis's doctor's office across town. She can go use this document to get medical information. She can use this document to hire the right physician, to admit him to the right place of care and to make sure that, that care decisions have continuity and there's no break in that. And in the absence of this document, in order to be able to make some of those decisions, she might have to go formally be given the power to do so by the court. Now again, there are statutory defaults, but having a document that clearly delineate, delineates the powers they have and their ability to step in and help is always the best way to do this. Beyond Mrs. Davis, it gets even more important because if Mrs. Davis was in the accident or had an issue, the children might not necessarily see eye to eye on this. So for Mr. Davis to be able to get ahead of this and decide in that circumstance who should make the decision, how should those decisions be made, always looking at that forward thinking instead of reactively. I think that would be the key in a situation like that where it's a, such an emotional mm -hmm. situation and you're dealing with what's going on at hand to have already made those decisions and set Absolutely. in who is going to make those decisions right. and kind of what decisions they are. The, the, the living will piece of the advanced medical directive. Can you talk a little bit more towards? Sure, so we now call that end of life instructions. I, I think a lot of clients confuse the terminology of a living will versus a will that is designed to distribute property at death, which we'll talk about right. later. We now refer to that section of the document as end of life instructions. Uh, and so basically the concept there is if you have been declared uh, terminally ill, if life expectancy is six months or less, or if you're in a persistent vegetative state, then that expresses your wishes. The end of life instruction section expresses your wishes as what you want to happen. Um, you know, just general summary, it's basically take care of me, don't prolong my life, give me comfort care, pain medication, even if it would hasten my life expectancy. Um, but that is the opportunity for you to put those instructions in writing so your agent clearly knows what you want to happen in that situation. If that's important to you, it's important that you make sure that that's written down and you have that in a, a directive. Many years ago, a client of mine, her daughter was in a car accident. Her daughter was in her early 20s, didn't have any planning in place, like a lot of early 20s individuals. And the daughter was in a coma. 
and the doctors indicated to my client there's no expectation that she's going to emerge from this coma, what do you think is the right thing to do? And the daughter had not provided the mom with a statement, this is what I would want to have happen. This is an impossible scenario for mom, regardless. Sure. But in a vacuum of not knowing how her daughter would have wanted to handle that circumstance, she's now trying to make a decision that's challenge. impossible. Yeah. And so just allowing your wishes to be known. The what do you think Mr. Davis would have wanted to do is not where we want to be right. in that circumstance. Good point. Yeah. So we have the leading will and the medical power of attorney in Virginia known mm -hmm. as the advanced medical directive. Other incapacitation documents that we need to be aware of? The other key document um, that we always recommend is the durable general power of attorney. Uh, and I often say that this is something I would expect really anybody walking down the street over age 18 should have, power of attorney and medical directive. So if the medical directive is for medical decision making, then you think of the power of attorney for business and financial decision making. So the risk that we're trying to solve for is avoiding that court, um, stepping in and making that decision for you as to who the right person is to have to make those decisions for you if you can't make them yourself. An analogy you could think about for the medical directive on the medical side and the power of attorney on the financial side is there are a lot of doors in my life that are only open to me. I'm the only one who can talk to the plan administrator on my retirement account or talk to my doctor. And those doors are locked. And what I'm doing is putting keys on a key ring. I'm putting a medical key on the key ring. I'm putting a financial key on the key ring so that if I'm incapacitated, the people I trust and the people that I gave access to those keys can pick them up and open those doors. Because if they don't have that key, they've got to get the court to open the door, and that's always the harder way to do it. You two have to do this a fair amount where you're talking about death and what's mm -hmm. just happened and somebody's passed away. But now, do we, do we transition into what happens when... Mr. Davis has now passed away. Well, the first step when someone passes away is to sit down and to look and understand what assets they owned on their date of death. It's, it's very critical to take an inventory of those assets and to understand not only what they owned, but how those assets were titled. Because that information will really dictate what happens next. For instance, he might have owned assets jointly with right of survivorship with Mrs. Davis. That's very common, you know, in a long-term married couple. Uh, the good news there is that asset that's owned jointly is going to pass automatically to Mrs. Davis. The court does not get involved with it. There may be an asset like life insurance that names Mrs. Davis as the direct beneficiary. Again, good news on that, that's going to pass automatically to her without any court involvement. But let's say there was a bank account that he had set up and lo and behold, Mrs. Davis never got there to get become joint owner right. on that account, happens right? All it time. happens all the time. Well, now that asset, if it's in his sole name alone, is subject to probate in that because people are like, ah, oh, what's probate? Scary word. A scary mm -hmm. word. And basically what it means is that that account is frozen. And now to unfreeze that account, we have to go through a court process. Uh, Mrs. Davis would have to go to court. She would have to appear, and this is again under Virginia law, she would have to appear before a probate clerk and be sworn in to manage her husband's estate. The bottom line, you're not making, the, Mr. Davis mm -hmm. is not making the decisions. The right. court and the state ta statutes yeah. are what dictates regardless of a, whether it makes any sense whatsoever as to who's, mm -hmm. that's who is going to receive the property and assets. Right. Something we probably want to avoid. So we need a will. At, at a minimum, a will is a way to not only appoint the person you want to be in charge of managing your affairs at death, the executor, exactly. So that's the person who's going to come in and you know make sure your final bills get paid, make sure you know final income tax returns get filed, all of those type of things that are needed to settle your affairs. Uh, and then once that process has been completed and all the court uh, requirements are met, then the executor will distribute those assets in the manner that the will dictates. 
the will is a document that cannot, in a, in, in a vacuum, it cannot operate outside of the supervision of the court. And so a misconception that's, that's common is, the only time I'm going to go through court is if I die and have not done any planning. And that would be true. If I died and had not done planning, the court will supervise the process because there's a default will under state statute. But if I build my own will, it's treated the same way as that default will under state statute. The will is a vehicle that has to go through the court system. And that's why what we typically recommend to every client is two things. Number one, we want you to have a will because there could be assets, even if we do everything we can to prevent assets from going through the will and therefore through probate, there could be assets that we weren't sure. aware of that arrive after death. So we wanna have a will to catch anything we miss. But the more we can avoid the will's application, the more we can look to other opportunities to pass the assets to beneficiaries. As Martha indicated, joint ownership with rights of survivorship, beneficiary designations, or a revocable trust. The more we can look at those non-will-based distribution systems, we've, we've avoided the court system completely. Right. And so we want to have the will just in case we've missed something and then focus on using some combination of those other tools. Back to Mr. and Mrs. Davis, and right. Mr. Davis has passed away, and hopefully he's done the planning and he has a will, but it sounds like that's not probably enough. You, you had mentioned beneficiary designations. Pretty key planning tool, pretty easy. Sure. Um, I want to speak a little bit more as to what the considerations are, how do we do it? Sure. So when we look at Mr. and Mrs. Davis, it's very common that many of their accounts would be jointly held with rights of survivorship which means when one spouse dies, it automatically carries over. But that doesn't help us very much on the second death because it's unlikely that Mrs. Davis is going to add her kids as co-owners on the accounts and absorb the fact that now her kids have, there's risk that now could, could face Mrs. Davis with the children as co-owners. So the beneficiary designation is potentially a much more stable tool for the Davises because unlike naming the kids as co-owners, which gives them rights and exposes risk, if they're merely beneficiaries down the road, there's less of a problem that's been created. So Mr. and Mrs. Davis could say something like this with respect to Mr. Davis's retirement accounts and life insurance. Mr. Davis could say the primary beneficiary is my wife, Mrs. Davis as to 100% of the benefits, and in the event she is not living at my death, my children are the beneficiaries in whatever proportions Mr. and Mrs. Davis believe is most appropriate. And now what we have, whether he dies first or second, the assets are passing outside of the will, outside of court supervision, the time and the expense of probate is eliminated, and the assets are reaching the beneficiaries in a much more streamlined way. The challenge with that, though, is if you don't want your children to have absolute control over those assets. We didn't give their children any ages, mm -hmm. but let's say, you know, 21 and 18, where I am looking this year, do I want my children to have a million dollar life insurance policy at, at this phase in their life? And my answer is no. <laughs> in my mindset, I want to have provisions that, mm -hmm. that manage that money for those girls until they get a little bit older. And at least probably around 30 is, you know, where I where I think for them that would be a good number. Back to the beneficiary designation and we just had a conversation this morning uh, amongst our planners extremely important to update those. Absolutely. We have had situations where ex-spouses and or having switched a job mm -hmm. and in the new employer either thought you did or in fact did submit but didn't have proof that you now had your spouse or partner being the primary beneficiary and all of a sudden it goes to the estate and what you thought was good planning. So um, not just creating the blueprint and having the plan but implementing that on a systematic basis right. um, um, for sure. So transitioning back to um, situations such as minor children trusts, right? That's where so this component comes in. And again, it's kind of like the estate planning term of trust. Do I need a trust? That mm. sounds really complex and expensive. And do, do you need a trust? Typically, one, one dividing point from the client who would likely not choose to use a trust because the advantages that the trust gives don't apply in that circumstance versus the client who would. 
um, there, there are two variables that may point toward using a trust or not. One is, as Martha indicated, is an outright distribution desired. I mean, if I died yesterday, am I okay that my beneficiaries get the money today and they can do anything they want with it? And that's, that's a litmus question. Because if the answer is no, if I died yesterday, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want them to get it right away. They're, they're not in an age and stage in their lives, or maybe there's an external environment around them, a marriage, a potential uh, risk of liability through work. There, there's, there is something that causes me to think that would not be a great idea. So let me interrupt just real quick. Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Davis, yeah. let's say they have one child yes. who is 30 and she is married and responsible right. and they are perfectly yep. happy with her inheriting and con maybe in that situation, yep. that list, litmus test is not passed. Maybe not. It might be that, that if they were to say, look, if this were tomorrow and she just gets it, she's responsible, stable, we have no concerns. The beneficiary designation can do everything we need it to do, avoids probate, passes the assets to her, and there, in that case, there may not be a desire to continue to put controls over what happens to that money moving forward. In that hypothetical, there's one child. Right. Okay, let's introduce one wrinkle to that. Two children in their 30s, stable, responsible. So in a vacuum, giving them the money and they're making choices on that money moving forward, no different than with just one child. But we've reached the second litmus test in my mind which is even if we're okay with I die, they get it. Well, I mean, I'm not okay with the I die part, but, but the <laughs> they get it part's fine if I right, die. Right, right, right. Then, then here's the question. With beneficiary designations, they're gonna get the money chronologically before that money is used to pay debts, expenses, and taxes. And so now we have these two siblings, the Davis's two kids. We'll call them Martha and Dan. Martha and Dan <laughs> are getting 50%, let's just say, of each of the assets. and. By the time they're getting those assets, some bills have already been paid, funeral bills, maybe some preliminary medical bills. There will be bills to be paid later, future medical bills, accounting fees, administrative costs. How well do Dan and Martha play in the sandbox together? Mm -hmm. Because if they're going to get this money and bicker and argue about the fact that mom and dad always paid more for your school than mine, you should pay more, we have to be aware and mindful of what that might look like. That does not mean beneficiary designations our mistake. It, I think it means we have to think ahead. Do we feel comfortable that they can get it and spend it right away? And do we feel comfortable if there are multiple beneficiaries that they're going to receive a gross distribution and they're going to net things out themselves? The money's not going to land in a central platform where someone's going to pay all the bills first and then the money goes downstream. The analogy I use often is I go to dinner with a handful of friends. And we don't really think about how we're going to handle the payment of the, of the meal until the check, check comes. And there's that one person who says, my wine wasn't topped off as much. And so I'm not going to pay as much. And that's where we, we can start person. to go. Right? Yeah. That person doesn't come to the next dinner <laughs> is where that happened. With beneficiary designations, we can't really solve that. Where it doesn't need to be solved, we don't need to overthink this. We don't have to overplan this. So beneficiary designations are a huge option, a very valuable option for people who do not feel the need to control the distribution beyond death, and they're comfortable that the beneficiaries are going to work out the administrative process. But they together. have to be honest in their assessment. Of that I mean, you, you cannot expect people who have never gotten along to magically reconnect and get along at death. The, the trust option, I often describe it to clients as if we are setting up like a little family business. It's not a business from a, an income tax perspective, but if you think about it like a business in that it's, an, it, it's somewhat of an entity that continues on after your death, and it gives us a management and control or business succession planning, if you will, so that, so that you can have Martha be the trustee Obviously, so that all the, all the debts and expenses <laughs> and everything gets <laughs> exactly right. everything gets taken care of properly before she releases half right. to her dear brother Dan um, so but I would take good care of you Thank I you promise very much. Let's you know? switch mm -hmm. the situation a little bit and go back to mr. and mrs. Davis and we're now um, they're a little bit younger than we thought they were um, okay. they're 34 mm -hmm. and they have three minor kids ages you know 12 9 and 4. They yeah. did their advanced medical directive, they have their durable power of attorney, and they have a will. Yep. We're pretty proud of them. They named a guardian. They're good, right? Nothing, nothing wrong with that. Nothing could go wrong, right? 
Well, I mean, there's this, then the issue is how you distribute assets to minor children. Uh, if we're looking forward and we want to manage that because if they're minors, they can't legally own the assets, then that's where uh, we, we, we tend to like to use the revocable living trust as an additional tool in the estate plan so that those instead of going through probate and managing those you know assets through the probate process the trust would you know separate and apart from the will controls those assets and will direct you know how those the, the guardian or the trustee for those children has access to those funds you have two scenarios one the, the davis's name beneficiaries with the hope that and the expectation that they're going to live long enough to see their kids sure. become old enough that this isn't going to happen for a while. Sorry. The problem is if something happens before then and they're minors, now we have a court-appointed guardian receiving their share on their behalf, which is bad news, but I don't think as bad as the next piece of bad news, which is when each of those kids turns 18, it's theirs. And now it's totally up to them how they manage and spend that money. 18. 18. And I don't know a lot of 18-year-olds who, having lost their parents in this hypothetical, are going to be in a position to make really wise decisions. Or maybe even in a best-case scenario, not to look back 5, 10, 15 years later with some level of regret. Of, I wish I had handled that better. But it's not fair to ask an 18-year-old, in many cases, to make good, wise decisions with that kind of money. Alternatively, what they could have done is they could have used the revocable trust to establish a system through which a trustee could watch over that money for those beneficiaries, always with the ability to make distributions to provide for them. We're not locking this money away. And it's at certain age parameters, if not earlier in the trustee's discretion, depending on how the trust is written, that the transition of the management happens from mom and dad to the trustee to the children in a very deliberate and planned out way. So the trust, is it's an actual document. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, similar to the will mm -hmm. and whereas in the will we have the executor that's pretty much mm -hmm. fulfilling what the will tells you that's to right. do the, the trust has a trustee Correct. that you just mentioned and I think you described well the scenario that we don't wish for but you do need to have an alternative game mm -hmm. plan and that's what this trust is and the coach in that game plan would be the trustee right correct fair right right it's fair when we think about some of these maybe more complex documents, it doesn't just apply to somebody who has a $10 million estate. It's, yeah. it's minor children, yeah. it's um, really minor children, or, or ch any children, I really and truly, because you're, you're trying to plan um, to make sure that that distribution, again, happens in a streamlined and efficient manner. So to Dan's point, the trust allows us to consolidate all the assets in one place, pay debts and expenses, and then make that distribution happen. Uh, and so if, you know, again, if there are complexities within the family dynamic, it allows us to, you know, plan for those complex situations. Very well said, complexities to the yeah. family dynamic, which we all know of, right? So it's not just kids, it's grandkids as well, right? right. So your son or daughter may have made choices that you agree with, don't agree with, but you're specifically focused on their daughter or son, and the trust document is what's gonna to enable to you, you on the second death when you're no longer there to guide. One recurring theme that echoes around all of this is the, the word control. If I've got young kids and something happens on a date night and, and I've got control now over the individual who's in charge of the money and what the rules are going to look like until the kids can be in control. I have control over how those kids are going to interact with each other and let's be candid how their spouses are going to interact with each other over the payment of debts, expenses and taxes. We have control over what happens to real estate. What if one of the kids wants to keep a property but the other one wants to sell it? Invariably the person who wants to keep it is the one who can't afford to keep it and how do we control the process? And it's not that trusts are always better than beneficiary designations. The question is, to what extent do we need control? In some, in some planning scenarios, we really don't need control. It's the single child who's stable, mature, and unless and until something happens to that child, we don't need a lot of flexibility and control. But it's in the circumstances, multiple children, in different circumstances, that trust can provide a tremendous amount of control 
depending on what's needed in the case. Uh, I'm going to kind of review where we are. One of the big benefits we're trying to get today is to make sure that people not only understand but are compelled to act. And in acting, we know that they need a medical power of attorney and a living will Mm -hmm. and a will. Right, those are probably the three. And the durable general power of attorney. And the durable power of attorney, Mm -hmm. thank you Martha. Those are the four main documents when they go to the estate planning attorney they really need to uh, implement. So thank you for providing your guidance uh, today and your insight. And we want to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in as well. Hopefully you've gotten some insight on the basics of estate planning to prompt you to either review your current documents or maybe have that initial planning meeting with the estate planning attorney. Uh, There is another video, so please feel free to tune in to that as well. We appreciate you joining us.